Otherwise, the rate wise is a normal range. LDH is 391, uric acid 6.5, and uh, urine is non revealing, and chest x ray is unremarkable. Uh, for this, she starts the antibiotics with CFEP, and the of is continued, and she is on hydration, and other support managements are continued. And the plan is to have blood culture and UV culture as well as to revise peripheral morphology with senior. Okay. Okay, so for uh, the interest of time, I will directly go to the update lecture. Um, so uh, today we are going to have an uh, update lecture on uh, sarcoidosis uh, and uh, the five cardinal phenotypes. So it has been very, very long time since we had lecture on uh, a talk on sarcoidosis. So I would invite Dr. Tedros to start his presentation. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz. And uh, good morning uh, again, everyone. So before I start uh, my talk on uh, update on sarcoidosis, the five clinical phenotypes, uh, I have an announcement. Uh, uh, I will, at the end of the presentation, uh, I will announce the chief resident selected for uh, the next year. So please stay Twinned, okay? Thank you. So I have already uh, told uh, the update, uh, the, the, the topic of the lecture. This is the outline of my talk. As an introductory remark, uh, as you know, sarcoidosis is a variable, multi-systemic granulomatous disease of unknown etiology, and it can affect virtually any organ, but it uh, mostly affects the pulmonary and lymphatic systems. Uh, and uh, its natural cause is either it can resolve by itself in around 50% of the patients or can progress to organ fibrosis and other complications. And uh, it can be an incidental finding or it can end up uh, in a devastating life uh, threatening uh, condition. When it comes to the epidemiology, uh, the usual age of occurrence is between uh, age 20 to 40, but it doesn't mean that that is, uh, doesn't occur ages beyond this range. Even uh, if you see the age, uh, the average, the median age in patients from the Scandinavian, where uh, the disease is common, it's a mean age is like 47 to 49. And uh, it's mostly, uh, this is the data from US. Uh, it is uh, incidence except in the Germans, the Scandinavians and uh, the Irish. Uh, it's in the whites, it's said to be lower, uh, the, and it's prevalence from uh, among 100,000 people, it's around 11, and female to female ratio is equal in the uh, European Americans. But in the African Americans, the incidence increases like 36 out of 100,000, and the female to male ratio is 2 to 1, and also the severity uh, is worse in African Americans. When it comes to the genetics, uh, it, it has a tendency of clustering in families and uh, family clustering uh, is uh, seen in five to 19% of the cases. And in a recent Swedish case control study, that's because it's, uh, Swedish is one of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian country and it's one of the common in, in there. It's uh, uh, the clustering the family was found to be 39% in Sweden. And the twin studies, nine out of 10 uh, monozygotic twins, they had sarcoidosis and its heritability in 210 twi twins was 66%. So it is uh, uh, somehow, uh, it has, uh, uh, it has uh, her heritability, uh, hereditary, it's a somehow a sort of hereditary disease, but it's polygenic, it's not uh, a one gene disease. Uh, when it comes to pathogenesis, uh, uh, we all know that it's uh, the, the etiology is unknown, but uh, it says that two things contribute for its uh, uh, occurrence. One is uh, there has to be a genetic predisposition, and the other is uh, there has to be exposure to a specific antigen, and uh, this antigen exposure in a genetically susceptible host results in the typical granulomatous inflammation. And this, uh, uh, in the past, it, it used to be said that it's only the H1 uh, exaggerated the response, but as of recent, as of 2018, also TH17 cell mediated immune response has been also playing role. So it's both the H1, T 
TH, TH1 and TH11, but it's mostly the TH17 cells, uh, which one of the CD4 cells that are now uh, contributing more uh, for its etiopathogenesis. Etio I don't know whether this is very visible to you or not, but um, uh, it's, uh, in the, it's uh, the etiopathogenesis and as a, uh, this antigen, it can be a microbial or environmental antigen. And that uh, when uh, the, the, this antigen is processed by uh, macrophages and presented to the T cells, uh, TH2, there will be proliferation of TH1 and TH17 cells. And this further induces the proliferation of monocyte and other lymphocytes and the like. And subsequently, that will end up in the production of uh, uh, cytokines like TNF uh, alpha, uh, interleukins, interleukin 17, interleukin 13, and the like. And uh, this uh, culminates in the formation of uh, sarcoid granuloma in different uh, parts of the body, the lymphatic lung. Uh, the jaw and the like. When you come to the <coughs> clinical presentation, the common signs and symptoms include cough, which is usually non-productive, uh, fever and weight loss, chest pains, usually central and sub-external, and dyspnea, usually ex uh, exertional. Uh, and this is mostly uh, the chest findings are in the pulmonary type of uh, manifestation. And in the extra pulmonary manifestation includes painful ankle swelling, uh, Painful red nodules onions, that's erythema uh, uh, nodosum. We find these manifestations in uh, uh, specific types of uh, 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 specific types of uh, 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 sarcoidosis, and we have eye pain or blurred vision uh, in the uh, when it affects the, the eye. Extra, this is a extra pulmonary manifestation, and the disease can be an acute or subacute, and uh, uh, the, so this, uh, this, this has a common manifestation, but also other common manifestation includes also radiological finding. Uh, for example, if you may find a patient having asymptomatic bilateral hilar or mediastinal adenopathy, which was uh, done for uh, either medical checkup or for, uh, you know, as part of investigation for other diseases, you may find this accidental finding. And this is one of the common presentation. The other presentation is in patients who have got uh, sim symptoms, respiratory symptoms like shortness of breath, on exertion, cough, chest pain, and the like. You can have also this as a classic pulmonary reticular opacities. It's also one of the common presentations. And the other common presentation is Lofgren syndrome. It's uh, one of the acute, uh, the, this is the classic acute presentation with fever and threads of erythema nodosum bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, joint symptoms of arthritis. And, and uh, those uh, patients with Lofgren syndrome are said to have good progress because of their acute presentation and the like, and no major symptoms and no major affection of the lung parenchyma or other uh, organs. Uh, and uh, it has got uh, high, uh, this specific gene abnormality. And this is one of the uh, clearly described uh, 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 syndromes in uh, sarcoidosis. When it comes to the physical examination, it's mostly extra manifestation because uh, most of the patients, uh, they don't have pulmonary findings, okay? The, uh, the, the lung findings usually are normal, but we usually have extra, manif extra pulmonary manifestation, like you can have skill lesions like erythema nodosum, the perspirinio, and uh, you can have uh, lesions uh, along the scar status and the like, or trauma sites. You can have parotid enlargement, lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy is mainly intrathoracic, but up to 11% of the patient can have uh, a, a peripheral lymphadenopathy, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, uh, neurologic findings, uh, especially cranial nerve seven uh, uh, palsy. In the eyes, uh, you can have painful red eyes uh, in the, uh, due to uveitis. And sometimes, uh, rarely, patients can have uveo parotid fever or Herford syndrome. Uh, plus, or this group of patients, they can have uh, or not uh, cranial nerve. Uh, in addition to this uh, fever and uveitis, they can have cranial nerve uh, cell palsy. And the other is metabolic manifestation like uh, hypercalcemia and uh, pancytopenia. This is a classic uh, lupus perineum. You have this uh, 
malicious uh, plaque and nodules on the cheeks and bridge of the noses. And it's, it's a sort of destructive. And uh, it is a good thing is that it responds to treatment. And this is before or and after uh, management. Uh, ex uh, continuing on the extra pulmonary manifestations, patients, up to 50% of patients can have a single organ involvement, uh, but the remaining 50%, uh, either they can have two organ involvement, three organ involvement, uh, the, as the number of organs involved, the, the, the percentage, uh, the, the, the frequency decreases. When you come to the initial evaluation, uh, you, you have to take history. Definitely, you can have a pulmonary or extra pulmonary manifestation, or both, uh, full, uh, just full examination, uh, including the uh, CNS, lymph node, uh, chest, uh, uh, everything, uh, including skin, joints, and the like. And uh, following laboratory tests are usually important, including CBC, renal function test, liver function test, serum calcium, 24-hour urine test for calcium levels and total immunoglobulins, and PPD. PPD is uh, helpful in differentiating uh, sarcoidosis uh, from other disease like tuberculosis because patients with sarcoidosis are generally said to be allergic. So if uh, in a patient suspected of sar sarcoidosis, the PPD is uh, positive, it's, uh, less, it's less likely to be sarcoidosis, okay? So it's helpful in that regard. Then chest X-ray is a routine, it's a, and also it's very important. And sometimes we can do a, a high resolution CT scan in patients who has got pulmonary involvement to differentiate it between uh, with other uh, similar disease like HCP, uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, uh, uh, and uh, TB and, and the like. And the other important investigation in pulmonary function test is electrocardiogram or ECG and uh, ophthalmic uh, evaluation are very important. Uh, these are the things that one should order when uh, an, on initial evaluation. When it comes to diagnosis, diagnosis generally, uh, diagno it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, <clears throat> and clinically, but it suggests that if, you, if there is evidence of two organ system involvement, it's, it makes it highly likely to be a sarcoidosis, but it's not a must. Uh, and uh, diagnosis requires two things. One is typical, you have to demonstrate typical non casating granuloma on biopsy from one side, plus exclusion of other cause of granulomatous inflammation like tuberculosis, uh, mycobacterium, ABM, intracellulary, fungus, and cancer. And uh, it usually needs uh, tissue, but you don't need to uh, uh, do biopsy in all the uh, suspected cases of sarcoidosis. If a patient is, you know, the classic, the common presentation, like if a patient, you have asymptomatic bilateral hilar adenopathy, that's not progressing in three to six months, you don't need to do uh, a biopsy. And if uh, also you have classic Lofgren syndrome, you don't need to, to biopsy because, uh, uh, you know, it usually resolves or, you know, what they require is only non anti-inflammatory drugs. And even if you biopsy it from the erythema it doesn't uh, show uh, the classic uh, granuloma, uh, non casating granuloma. It uh, rather shows pancreas, so it, it, it's not helpful. And most of uh, these patients have got uh, good, uh, good response. But when it comes to the biopsy, as much as possible, uh, it also applies for uh, malignancies also. You know, uh, you have to, uh, by, take vibes from accessible sites. You don't need to be take from very distant or uh, uh, or uh, inv invasively. So if there is a skin lesion or peripheral lymphadenopathy, you can take from that. Otherwise, you, the only option you may be left is with intrathoracic lymphadenopathy or the length. So, so in the past, it, it used to be mostly on the transbronchial biopsy, which usually we also now we are doing this transbronchial biopsy, and the yield is up to 90 percent. There are, there are radiologic infiltrates, but if there are no radiologic infiltrates, it becomes uh, as low as 30 to 40 percent. And the other was mediastinoscopy, but if uh, the yield high, it's invasive one, and nowadays it's not favored one. The current uh, favored investigation uh, method is in the uh, or uh, the endobronch endobronchial endoscopic ultrasound guided TBNA, and it uh, yields up to 94 percent. and. Uh, currently, we don't have this uh, gadget, this instrument, but uh, we, we think that uh, we may have it in the future. And uh, there was one study that has compared this uh, EBUS with 
transbronchial biopsy and uh, the EBS uh, yield was up to 94% in that study, uh, whereas the finding from transbronchial biopsy was uh, 33%. So EBS is, um, is really better and with less side effect. Uh, uh, where the part, this is a classic, uh, you can see the classic uh, non-casating granulomas uh, with a biopsy. In a summary of the diagnosis, uh, I have already said that the diagnosis of exclusion and the de definitive diagnosis requires three to six months follow up if no biopsy is done. Uh, and chest x ray is very important. And you need to always evaluate for extra pulmonary involvement. And there are situations where you will be forced only to diagnose clinically, where a uh, situation where the, that you don't need. Biopsy includes typical uh, left grand syndrome and asymptomatic bilateral hilar lymph nodes. If you have this, you don't need to do biopsy. Uh, uh, so if you need biopsy, if you decide biopsy is needed, choose most accessible, least invasive site. Uh, and uh, next we'll see the radiographic or uh, scanning uh, staging. Uh, this is, uh, was initially uh, done with chest X-ray, but we can put also the equivalent chest CT. So uh, stage one which accounts for around 50% of the cases. And it's usually bilateral uh, hilar uh, involvement and with uh, plus or minus right uh, paratracheal involvement. Uh, and uh, majority up to 75 to 80% of the stage one uh, cases, they resolve by themselves. Stage two is uh, uh, the bi bi bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy plus uh, infiltrates, reticular infiltrates, or uh, lymph uh, lymph uh, lymphatic infiltrates in the, in the mostly in the upper part of the lungs. It's usually bilateral, uh, and uh, it accounts for 25% of the cases, and up to 40, 50% they resolve by themselves. The stage three is there is no lymph node, but you have this reticular uh, infiltrates in the lung, but this time the lymph node has gone. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, as the stage advances, uh, the, the chance that it resolves by itself will be lower and it's only up to 20% of the patients that can spontaneously resolve at, this, at uh, stage three. The stage four is uh, where you have this fibrotic and uh, cystic changes with volume loss, uh, no lymph node. Uh, so at this stage, it's uh, almost uh, rare that it can resolve by itself. Uh -huh. This, this is what I was telling you, the likelihood of remission by radiologic and stage one is up to nearly 80% can resolve by themselves, stage two up to 40%, stage three up to 20%, stage four just nearly uh, none of them can resolve. When it, uh, just uh, to, to, to describe more on the pulmonary uh, sarcoidosis, the uh, characteristics of lung involvement of all patients, is, uh, even you can have this stage zero, stage zero is when the, you don't have uh, pulmonary involvement or uh, intra uh, thoracic lymph, lymph node involvement. So you can have in patients with uh, uh, extra uh, extra uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis, and uh, in the, uh, one study, uh, up to 8.3 percent they didn't have any chest abnormalities. A stage one accounted for uh, 40 percent. Stage one accounted for 36, 37 percent, and stage three. Uh, 10% and stage four was 5%. And uh, if you see the spirometry, mostly uh, the abnormalities are that of restrictive pattern where you have the FEVC is, uh, uh, is reduced. Uh, but, you know, uh, if you take uh, all, all the whole patients, uh, the majority have normal pulmonary function. But if you take those patients who have got lung involvement, and if, uh, the, the probably next to the, the normal findings, the commonest is a restrictive pattern with reduced FEVC, but up to 16%, or, uh, but in this particular case, up to 40%, they can have uh, obstructive pattern, FEV1, FEVC ratio reduced. When you come to the differential diagnosis, uh, you can have uh, infectious cause of ground, uh, it includes infectious cause of ground, this like, uh, particularly we have to differentiate sarcoidosis from TB and uh, uh, malignancy and lymphomas. So these are the most important things, but if you have only the uh, lung involvement with no lymph, lymph node, hypersensitive pneumonitis uh, should be also considered uh, and uh, vasculitis like unconstituted vasculitis. And uh, they generally say if, uh, if uh, the, the patients are 
is more than age 40, weight loss more than 10% of the body weight, and the patient has got length findings, tender lymph nodes, positive tuberculosis uh, skin test, and asymmetric bilateral hyalur lymph node, please consider other uh, alternative diagnosis. And uh, uh, generally, uh, uh, if a patient has got as asymmetric bilateral hyalur lymph node, on just X-ray, uh, it's less likely to be sarcoidosis. It's most probably TB. And uh, by the time patient has got bilateral island lymph node, uh, on patient you, have, you suspect lymphoma or cancer, they are symptomatic. So that, that can help you in differentiating uh, from sarcoidosis. The other uh, important uh, area to mention among the specific uh, uh, extra pulmonary is the cardiac sarcoidosis because it's the second uh, cause of uh, death among patients with sarcoidosis. Number one is by the respiratory failure, and the second is a cardiac, uh, uh, and it can uh, result in sudden death. So it needs some mention. Uh, it can be due to this ca sudden cardiac death. Uh, in cardiac sarcoidosis can be due to complete third degree uh, heart block or ventricular tachycardia. And uh, you need to uh, you know, suspect uh, or rule out cardiac uh, sarcoidosis in patients who diagnose with uh, some pulmonary or other sarcoidosis or without, with or without cardiac symptoms. Uh, you need to evaluate them for subclinical as well as clinical cardiac involvement, particularly if they have got arrhythmias, conduction, disease, and heart failure. And in patients uh, age uh, less than 60 or 55 with unexplained syncope, pre-syncope or sustained palpitation or unexplained new onset conduction system, uh, system disease such as sustained second or third degree AV block, you need to rule out. And in patient with ventricular tachycardia, uh, uh, unexplainable one. And in patient with unexplained cardiomyopathy, you need to rule out sarcoidosis. And what test do you, you should do? Basic ECG. Uh, you can uh, pick uh, heart blocks, QR prolongation, with or without uh, bundle branch blocks, uh, ventricular, uh, ventricular premature uh, beats, and the like. And but none of these are. Uh, specific for cardiac sarcoidosis and uh, ECG has low sensitivity, usually less than 50% uh, for detection of cardiac sarcoidosis. And you need to do echocardi echocardiogram, Holter or event monitor. Uh, advanced testing includes cardiac MR uh, with uh, Gordon name, but we don't have this. And you can do also PET scan. That's very helpful for to to, start to pick active disease, but they, they are not routinely done and they are, they are not available. Routine. When it comes to the phenotypes, uh, you know, uh, this uh, patients can have, you know, one of the, the postulates for uh, sarcoidosis due to uh, some, anti, uh, some antigen exposure is uh, berylosis. Berylosis, uh, it's, it's a patho if you see the pathology, uh, it's non casating granuloma. You can differentiate it, you know, by, from pathological point of view from sarcoidosis but it's due to exposure to berylosis. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very close, similar to sarcoidosis, but when it comes to sarcoidosis, for example, we have this Lofgren syndrome. It's uh, one of the clearly described uh, types, but the other phenotypes were not described. And uh, even though we are seeing some clustering among uh, the different types of uh, sarcoidosis, be it pulmonary or extrapulmonary, uh, the, 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 there was no a study before to, to, to identify those clustering. And uh, this study was, uh, uh, which called the genotype phenotype relationship in sarcoidosis project, which was done in 31 uh, European uh, centers, all uh, patients phenotyped according to a standardized protocol. And the study court included uh, more than 2,000 uh, white patients, Caucasians, they are mostly whites. Um, and uh, in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this study, if you see the the the, the, the male uh, predominated in the earlier uh, decades, you know, in the second, third, and fourth decade, it's a male with uh, predominantly, but in the latter uh, stage uh, uh, decades, like uh, starting from the fifth, it's the females who predominated, and uh, uh, the average age, the mean age in this study was 47 years, and uh, according to access description of organ involvement in sarcoidosis. Uh, the percentage of involvement uh, of organs in this particular study was pulmonary involvement was like 75 percent, but uh, bronchial involvement 70 percent. But overall, uh, lung involvement was like 94 percent, and uh, intrathoracic uh, lymph nodes accounted for 7 percent. 
77%, and uh, uh, skin involvement was 16%, eye involvement was 7.8%, and um, uh, um, and the others, you can't see it, but it's uh, a, a lower in the other, and eye is 7.5%. And what they did in this study is to, to, to see for uh, clustering of uh, organ involvement. They used this multiple correspondence analysis. It's a software, st statistical software analysis uh, to, to extract principal components, which were then subjected to hierarchical clustering or principal component analysis. Uh, and uh, they come up with this uh, uh, scatter plot. Uh, the description and uh, when they took dimension one uh, versus dimension two, uh, the first one, the green dot, is, uh, each dot represents each patient and uh, there was a cluster, clustering of the abdominal organs involvement like the spleen, liver, bile duct and, and to some extent kidneys and when, uh, when, uh, when they found that the spleen was involved, the chance that the liver was involved was like 80% or something like that and vice versa. So there was uh, some uh, clustering of uh, abdominal organ involvement according to this. And when they consider dimension one with dimension three uh, in the spot and the, this scattered uh, 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 what they, they see is uh, cluster two, cluster two is a red uh, dot, the red dots. And if you see the cluster two are the uh, O triple C, that's ocular. The eye, if you see this, the cardiac or the heart, cutaneous and sinus involvement. So, and here, what they also identified is uh, there is also this uh, uh, cluster series, the uh, musculoskeletal and cutaneous involvement, the muscle joint and the skin involvement. So, there was some uh, pattern that they, they could identify, and the uh, uh, cluster four was pulmonary and lympho uh, lymphonodal, and cluster five was extrapulmonary. In the extra pulmonary, lung involvement was found to be very low, but in the rest, even though it's abdominal, uh, ocular, cardiac, cutaneous, uh, sinus, pulmonary involvement was universal in all, but there was a tendency for uh, observing these five uh, pheno clinical phenotypes. So when you come to the uh, abdominal, these are the five uh, clinical phenotypes, and in the abdominal cluster, you see the liver involvement and the spleen involvement is very high and also uh, kidneys to some extent. And, uh, but if you see the length, it's 99%. Uh, next is the uh, ocular, uh, cardiac, cutaneous, and CNS. You see CNS involvement was higher here. Uh, eye involvement, uh, you know, the chance that if somebody has got uh, CNS involvement, the chance that the patient can have eye involvement was very high percentage like uh, in the range of 90% or something like that. And the chance that they will have also cardiac involvement is higher. So there is, a, 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 to some extent, uh, clustering and also there will be uh, skin involvement also was 29%. So this is OCC, the ocular, uh, cuta, uh, ocular cardiac, cutaneous and CNS involvement. The third cluster is musculoskeletal cutaneous. That is uh, arthritis was higher in this group, 89%. 0.6 percent with muscle um, joint and skin involvement was like 42 percent. So the, this is a third cluster or the third clinical phenotype. And the fourth clinical phenotype was pulmonary lymphonodal. Uh, the pulmonary involvement was 100 percent, and uh, to some extent lymphonodal involvement. And the last was extra pulmonary. If you see here, the pulmonary involvement is very low, 11.6 percent. In this group, what was noted was the kidney involvement was higher. Uh, so when it comes to the treatment, uh, what, uh, all uh, as we uh, seen earlier, um, some uh, percent of patients, like 50% uh, of the patient with uh, uh, sarcoidosis because they respond uh, spontaneously, we don't treat all of them. And also patients, not only pulmonary, uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis at earlier stage, stage one and stage two, and to some extent stage three, but also patients with uh, uh, extra pulmonaries, they can have also uh, resolution by itself, spontaneous resolution. So uh, treatment uh, uh, should be only in those who have got indications. So this includes severe systemic symptoms, progressive pulmonary disease, cardiac sarcoidosis, neurosarcoidosis, site limiting ocular disease, symptomatic or disfiguring cutaneous disease, 
hypercalcemia or hypercalciuria and other significant organ system involvement. And the therapies to consider include the steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. And uh, for example, we can use this for those joint involvement in the brain syndrome and something like that. They can be managed only with anti-pains. Uh, corticosteroids, it can be topical or uh, systemic. We can use topical for uh, like ocular, skin and also uh, pulmonary at early stage only who has got calf, uh, disturbing calf or wheezes, we can manage, we manage them with uh, 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 local uh, steroids and uh, PO steroids or, uh, can be used for advanced uh, disease. The other is anti-malaria. These are usually for uh, cutaneous type, uh, methotrexate and other immunosuppressive agents anti-TNF agents, and uh, finally, organ transplantation, particular link transplantation are options. Uh, we'll focus mainly on treatment of pulmonary sarcoidosis, and uh, patients with early stage disease frequently may have spontaneous remission, as I have said it all earlier, and asymptomatic patient can usually be observed for three to six months, and treatment is more likely to be in symptomatic patients with objective disease progress, particularly if they have got you know, uh, pro, uh, worsening is uh, imaging or pulmonary deterioration in pulmonary function test. And the first line of drug to treat sarcoidosis, as you all know, is systemic steroids. And because we have vast experience with that and usually effective, that is the way we also manage here. Uh, but uh, what we have to be cautious with the dosing. You know, uh, there was this study that has shown that uh, even the gains, the gains with the start of steroid was uh, witnessed in the first three months of starting prednisolone. So, you know, giving for many years or something is not uh, beneficial. And uh, the FEVC improvement was only marginal, you know. If, if you, you say that it's a significant uh, permanent function test improvement. If it's more than, you know, five to 10%, in this study, it was 7.4%. And, but there was no difference in FEVC improvement between those who received uh, high dose and low dose, you know, cumulative dose of uh, prednisolone of uh, for, for, uh, less than 4,000. 4, and they compared those who received less than 4,000 and uh, those uh, who received more than 4,000 in a year time, which means this, you know, giving like 20 milligram uh, to 30 milligram for uh, three to six months and then putting them on 10 or, le 10 or less milligram uh, per day for the rest of the the year, you know, the, it is in a one year. So if it, as much as possible, don't exceed 4,000 milligram limit in a year time because those who received more than 4,000 milligram in a year time were, were found to have a significant uh, side effect like uh, which was uh, seen by increased weight gain and uh, the like. So uh, those who received, uh, the, because there is no difference, those who received higher dose and low dose in, in, in terms of improving the pulmonary function test, but they have a significant difference uh, with the side effects, those who received higher dose. So uh, it's usually advised that the lesser dose and lesser duration of treatment. So uh, the, 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 this was written after that study and steroids for sarcoids, uh, that, the study which was done by Bruce. Bruce. So what they say is uh, uh, prednisolone remains a necessary treatment in the management of sarcoidus. So the clinician should be constantly aware that the higher the cumulative dose of prednisolone, the more toxicity that will be encountered. So therefore the initiation of steroid sparing agents such as methotrexate or azathioprine should be considered within the first few months of treatment while any corticosteroid therapy is associated with increased risk of comorbidity. The study by process also showed the lesser is the better. So uh, as much as possible, you know, we have to limit the dosing to like uh, 0.5 milligram per kg or 20 to 40 milligram in the initial uh, one to three months and then to, to decrease it. This is a summary of a summary table and uh, those with uh, treatment in the pulmonary sarcoidosis. Uh, on the left uh, side, those with asymptomatic, just they need only follow up with pulmonary function tests and those with minimal symptoms like cough, you can use inhaled corticosteroids and no response, you can consider oral steroids. In those with moderate disease, that's either having chest X-ray stage two or high uh, pul uh, lower pulmonary function uh, performance or low below normal pulmonary function test and dyspnea. If uh, the patient has got one of these, consider steroid and follow at least for three months. If the patient has got two or more of these, begin prednisolone as a dosage of 
20 to 40 milligram daily and taper those over three to six months. And if uh, you can maintain uh, at a prednisolone dose those less or equal to 10 milligram daily, uh, continue prednisolone. But if the patient cannot be controlled or needs more greater or equal to 10 milligram or, or patient develop toxicity, you need to add cytotoxic drugs like methotrexate, azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate, and uh, uh, others. So here we, we add usually methotrexate, you know, and um, the dose of methotrexate can be ranged from 7.5 milligram up to 25 milligram. So you can build it slowly in uh, just it's given once per week. And uh, this is a second line therapy. First line is prednisolone, second line is this uh, cytotoxic drugs. And if, the, if we fail to manage with this, uh, then you can uh, have the third, third line that is uh, the anti-TNF therapy. If you, if you remember, uh, in the etiopathogenesis, in the immunogenesis, uh, one of the, the cytokines that was released was TNF. So any treatment that targets uh, TNF will be uh, very uh, useful. And this uh, uh, group of drugs include infliximab and adalimumab. Uh, we don't have this group of drugs, but uh, you need to know it. And uh, so management of refractory disease is, you know, uh, uh, when do you say refractory permanent sarcoidosis? If a patient fulfills uh, two of these criteria, as the patient will have a progress permanent disease despite uh, glucocorticoid treatment uh, for at least 10, uh, 10 milligram per, uh, per day for at least three months after initial dose of 20 to 40 milligram and need for a second uh, line agent due to lack of efficacy, drug toxicity or intolerability. And second criteria is treatment uh, started for impaired quality of life due to pulmonary symptoms and uh, additional disease uh, manifestation. And pro, uh, here as a definition, uh, when do you say progressive? When there is percent or worsening dyspnea or cough, if it is decline of more than 5%, worsening six minutes work, work distance, and lack of decline of uh, the SCE. And uh, if the patient, you also evaluate for pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension, which is one of uh, the complications uh, or cardiac sarcoidosis and you do your chest CT in this case, if there is extensive involvement of the lung, that's the one of the indication for chest CT. And if you find irreversible uh, pathologies like nodules, micronodules and peribronchular thickening, then you treat with uh, a second, uh, third line. Uh, but if there is already ar architectural distortion and the like, uh, what you uh, is indicated is to consider PET scan, if there is some active component, that's the only uh, chance that you can give treatment for this group of uh, uh, patients who have got any being uh, bully and the like with uh, final distraction and the like. Oh, excuse me. So, the, uh, we, so we, uh, if you uh, only started on uh, first line, then you uh, treat them with second line, either methotrexate, as that or primo, the other. And if improved, continue. And if it doesn't improve, then you go with the second line biologicals like the uh, influx map or something like that. And uh, uh, still a refractory, consider experimental therapies. But for those who has already, uh, you know, advanced disease, uh, supportive treatment like pulmonary rehabilitation. This is a study which has shown the effect, effectiveness of infliximab in uh, this, this is a biologicals in refractory uh, PET, uh, FDG PET positive sar sarcoidosis. And if you, as you can see in this graph, it has definitely shown after initiation of infliximab, as uh, a pulmonary function as the FEVC has improved significantly after six months of treatment. Even those who have got advanced disease, if the PET scan is positive, you can treat with a third line biologicals. And uh, this is a treatment summary. Uh, you need to observe for, to, for three to six months before therapy if possible, because there is a chance of spontaneous remission. First line treatment when warranted is prednisolone for usually four nine to 12 uh, months and tr treat promptly if there is symptomatic neurologic, cardiac, eye sarcoidosis or symptomatic hypercalcemia. Treat mild skin or eye disease with topical steroids and use alternative treatment uh, this is a refractor or, or toxic unacceptable with second line like methotrexate. Uh, also, uh, hydroxychloroquine for skin, usually they reserve it for skin and uh, joint. And consider infliximab if the intolerable side effect or continue this, progr this progression. 
When it comes to the prognosis, the resolution occurs in more than 50% of the patients, persistent fibrosis in 25%, chronic progressive disease in 25%, and fatal in 5%. Usually, uh, disease occurs in pulmonary and cardiac, but also can occur in others. Predictors of good prognosis includes those with erythematosum, stage one uh, chest X ray abnormality, uh, and, and in those with asymptomatic presentation. and Predictors of pro prognosis includes lupus perineo, cardiac, neurologic, bone involvement, and nephrolithiasis. These are cause of this, as I have told you. Uh, respiratory failure is a common cause of this, followed by cardiac arrest. So usually, it can be sudden cardiac arrest. And long term complication includes pulmonary and extra pulmonary manifestation. In the pulmonary, you can have fibrosis, uh, pulmonary aspergillosis or aspergilloma, pulmonary hypertension. In the kidney, renal failure, cardiac uh, sudden days, neurosarcoidosis, def uh, defacing lupus perineum, and loss of sight. And in summary, sarcoidosis comprises uh, a heterogeneous set of clinical phenotypes, maybe representing separate disease. What we take note here is that the, the phenotypes they described is only in the white patients. And so uh, probably it should be done in Africa or Asia or uh, other part of the world to see if, if auto is the same in other populations. And sarcoidosis is not anymore recognized as a benign disease, as you can see, in particular those who, are, who have got symptoms, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it can be a deadly disease. And uh, uh, there was a study which has been done in Sweden, uh, which has shown uh, that uh, when they compared, it's uh, from the registry, when they compared the death rate uh, of uh, sarcoidosis with non sarcoid cases. The patients with uh, sarcoid, they have 1.6 times hazard uh, uh, risk ratio of dying. Uh, and it's no more a benign disease. Corticosteroids uh, therapy is the main or the, uh, the first uh, line therapy. And uh, you can find similar efficacy and less side effect can be probably be reached through lower and shorter dosing regimens and second line and third line therapies for refractory cases. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I can accept questions. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for your uh, uh, excellent presentation, which was uh, clear, um, summarized, and uh, full of new data. So uh, I would just like to add, uh, uh, to emphasize that like a lot of patients with uh, uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis with um, lymphadenopathy, they, came, they come to hematology uh, with uh, a diagnosis of Hodgkin's lymphoma sometimes. So you need to have a very good pathologist to differentiate between these two things. And the course also would, uh, and the other B symptoms or constitutional symptoms would create uh, more confusion. So uh, we had a uh, few patients uh, who were sent to us for lymphoma and then later they were, they were found to have sarcoidosis and, uh, and the course is completely different. So I would like to uh, give the chance uh, uh, of uh, comments uh, to the Pulmonary unit first, and then other units can follow. So, uh, any anyone from pulmonary side, you can you can take your turns and uh, give your comments or questions. And you have one uh, question in the chat box. Uh, we'll come to that later on. Dr. Abdullah, Dr. Abdi. Yeah. If there is no one from preliminary side, then I am glad that you raised the issue of Hodgkin's disease. Eddie, you are aware that uh, Professor Getacho has had published his experience. And what we have recognized here is invariably patients are treated with anti-TB before the diagnosis of uh, I mean, sarcoidosis was made. So for one reason or another, patient end up being treated and then when symptoms fail to, fail to regress or the lymph nodes, then the, this diagnosis is considered. 
one thing I would like to ask uh, Dr. Abdi is, you know, Hodgkin's is a differential diagnosis, but here, you know, because diagnosis is often difficult, and when we give them steroids, you know, the, we know the response to sarcoidosis is, I would say, more or less dramatic, but uh, for Hodgkin's it isn't. So sometimes can we use this kind of criteria? Because, you know, if we don't have accessible lymph nodes in the cervical region, it's very difficult to have biopsy, you know, if the lymph nodes are just at the hilar area. And the other thing is, TB confuses when there is HIV. So it's always to rule out HIV because it's when there is HIV that you will find this primary form of tuberculosis like lymphadenopathy and the like. So if someone doesn't have HIV, then you know, in an adult for TB to manifest with generalized lymphadenopathy or higher lymphadenopathy is very unusual. And the other thing is IGRA I mean, and PPD are very difficult because, because one, the test is not available. And the other thing is when there is uh, HIV, patients would turn out to be negative, likely. And, and I don't know how would that be useful in our setting. Maybe in the European setting, it does. So these are few comments. And my question is, can we use criteria, steroid response, as uh, in our case? I mean, I don't advise, uh, you know, to be used right and left, but can it be uh, a clue in order to consider sarcoidosis as a differential? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Wenderson and uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah for your uh, comments. They are very helpful. And uh, this has uh, this uh, lymphoma and uh, TBR, uh, just as, as one of uh, the differential diagnosis, and that's confusing. And it's very difficult in our setup also to differentiate because of uh, limitation in the investigation uh, uh, because we don't have IBAS. But uh, I think this problem will be resolved in a few months' time. We are going to acquire IBAS due to our lung cancer project. Uh, we hope, hopefully, at that time, you know, patients can get, uh, you know, the right decision treatment uh, uh, just in time. Uh, but, you know, even, uh, even in the presence of that, uh, you know, patients on whom we strongly suspected uh, uh, sarcoidosis, uh, we can't observe them for three to six months. The, the problem is that if you suspect another condition, that's the, that's the, the, the time we will be forced to do biopsy. Otherwise, in patients who are asymptomatic, Bilateral hyaluronic lymph, lymph node, you don't need to biopsy them, okay? If you strongly suspect sarcoidosis and they, are, they remain usually asymptomatic. But once they start to be symptomatic, then that is the time to do biopsy. And that is, uh, we have to do it with ABUS. Uh, but if you don't have those, I think there is still a place for uh, empiric uh, uh, steroid tre treatment, you know, uh, particularly, you know, if, if we are able to exclude TB and lymphoma. Uh, so there is a place, but it has to be in consultation with a pulmonologist or experience in the management of this group of patients. Uh, we, ha we have a few patients here. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, it's Dr. Hamsal who told me this morning that uh, Dr. Getacho has got a paper with some surgeons on uh, exp his experience on sarcoidosis. I, I need to see it, sorry. Uh, I, I think that will be very helpful. <clears throat> uh, to write our, uh, our experience also here. We have several patients here. Majority, we manage them with, with the steroids, but uh, some of the patients were, were you know, uh, we had to start them on uh, additional cytotoxic drugs, mostly methotrexate, and they do very well. But we don't need to start uh, treatment in all patients. That's the, the message I want to, uh, to pass today. Thank you. Uh, with regard to uh, Dr. Saifu's question, Shall I answer, uh, Dr. Abdullah? Dr. Saifu has asked me. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, shall we settle the issue of Hodgkin's lymphoma here? Maybe before okay. we proceed to other okay. questions. Uh, regarding uh, Hodgkin's confusion with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma and sarcoidosis, we are fortunate that uh, sarcoidosis is rare, um, and uh, uh, that's one thing. The other thing is. We rarely 
are in rush to treat patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma according to their clinical presentation because we usually, we, we almost treat after biopsy. So with a good biopsy, it's not very difficult to differentiate between Hodgkin's lymphoma and sarcoidosis because in Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, we don't have granulomas. And, uh, and most of the types of Hodgkin's lymphoma that we have, we usually get um, uh, a good number of Fried Stenberg cells. So I think uh, uh, like to, mm -hmm. it would be a problem if we want to treat a patient empirically. Otherwise, if we get a tissue, it would not be a problem. So uh, we, we stick to the principle that we need to start lymphoma treatment only after biopsy. So I think we don't need to move any further. Uh, having said that, uh, you have a, a few questions in the chat box, uh, and uh, and if there are uh, one or two comments, uh, otherwise we are uh, running uh, late. So we will go to the problem. This... Yeah, this is Vera. Vera, mm -hmm. continue. Okay, uh, thank you, Teddy, for uh, a very nice presentation. Especially, I got an information. Like I see patient uh, for uh, some other reasons, they come to me uh, who is uh, under full up for sarcoidosis, taking a steroid lifelong. And uh, the message you give is uh, very important that, uh, you know, a cumulative dose of uh, steroid, the short term treatment. I, I actually, it, uh, for me, it is a take home message. I'm not a treating physician, but I see this kind of taking a lifelong. Coming to the cardiac uh, sarcoidosis, usually we don't see cardiac sarcoidosis. And uh, uh, I have patient with cardiac amyloidosis. And uh, you know, the bad part of this infiltrative cardiac disease, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, is, is almost a day sentences. Uh, we don't help them much and uh, they don't respond to treatment. And uh, coming to my question is like, how do you see in our setup a response to steroid treatment if they are chest X-ray stage three and four? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Dufera. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Me... Teddy, uh, okay. and I, I can summarize the, the chat box questions and you can answer them together. So okay. in the chat, in the chat box, most of them are um, uh, appreciations for your presentation. Most all of them saying excellent presentation. Uh, there are two uh, questions and comments. Uh, one is, is it uh, like the uh, uh, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, that it is um, immune dysregulation? That is one answer, uh, one question from uh, Dr. Mangstu. And the other question is, uh, what's the place of rituximab? So you can answer all this and then maybe we will end our uh, uh, okay. session. Thank you. Uh, the place of rituximab in the management of sarcoidosis, it's, uh, it's, it's included in the, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, other options, you know, uh, and they are, they are on trial, you know, uh, still it's not uh, confirmed, but uh, it's included here. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. One of the experimental therapies. So, uh, yeah, definitely there, there will be a place for it. And if you see here, experimental therapy, Rutuximab is one of those options. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Sefu, for raising that. Uh, the other is, um, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 question. Yeah, immune dysregulation. I don't know how, how we call uh, whether this is immune dysregulation or not, but there is some, uh, in my reading, I found that there is some connection between IBDs and uh, sarcoidosis uh, due to their, uh, in their etiopathogenesis. And, but uh, etiopathogenesis of sarcoidosis is evolving. You know, as of recent, the role of this TH17 uh, over TH1, uh, is gaining momentum and it's a, a focus of area for a study. So I, do, I don't know the etiopathogenesis of uh, IBD, but there, there must be, there, there may be some connection to that. 
uh, and Mangusto also has asked, is there any biomarker to see before uh, uh, advanced chest manifestation? Uh, there, 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 there is a place for um, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme that, that's not uh, very much helpful. Uh, it, it is uh, positive in 60% in, in of patients with active disease and 10% of with chronic disease, but I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether it can help to pick uh, early disease, but may be helpful rather for treatment response. The, other, the last question was from Dr. DeFera. Uh, what is your experience with the response to uh, steroid in the patient with the stage three, uh, stage four disease? Stage four disease, they don't respond. But stage three, there is a, a place for uh, steroid, but plus you need to add uh, second line, methotrexate. We add usual methotrexate or sometimes azathioprine. So uh, there is a place for stage three, even to, to resolve by itself by uh, in 20% of the cases. And we, we have uh, some experience. Uh, it's a very limited experience on my side. Uh, maybe Dr. Ramsalu, if he's in the link, he may be the right person to answer that question. Uh, if, uh, uh, if we are done, I have, uh, sh shall we conclude this? Dr. Uh, Abdulaziz, and I have an announcement to make. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. And I would like to thank the participants uh, and the residents for uh, active uh, participation. Uh, so I will pass the mic to you and... Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdulaziz, for uh, uh, leading the session. So my uh, the announcement is that uh, we had a meeting, a staff meeting last week, and uh, uh, we have uh, selected the chief residents for 2020-21, and uh, Dr. Idnak Acho has been uh, uh, chosen as the uh, chief resident, uh, followed by Dr. Edom, first assistant chief, uh, Dr. Adana, second assistant chief, Dr. Tasfa Mariam, third assistant chief, uh, uh, and congratulations. Uh, Dr. Idnak Acho, Dr. Edom, Dr. Adan, and Dr. Tosfamare in that order uh, for uh, being selected as chief and assistant chief. Uh, bef and before I conclude that the staff has uh, acknowledged the contribution of the residents overall in the, uh, our fight for uh, in the COVID. And we'd like to thank you, our residents, for doing great and excellent job uh, in this uh, difficult time. Thank you. Uh, we have finished the session for today. Thank you. Thank you.